All right. Hello, folks. Welcome to the Causal Inference Mixtape Book Club uh, live session. This time we're doing it a little bit off cycle. Uh, I usually do this on Sundays at 8 a.m. PST, but I was traveling. So I uh, we're going to do it today. And as we're going to learn, or we've learned in this book already, a little bit of randomness is needed for causal inference so we're just playing right into the theme of the uh, of the text itself so I hope you don't mind I see a couple of chats coming in we got Annie and we got Rahul I'm glad to see that folks could make it at this time so let's just uh, jump right into it let me pull up the virtual window here so today we are going to do a shorter and quicker live stream so today we'll just talk about the uh, chapter overview, and then we'll talk about um, we'll talk about a little bit about what the next chapter is going to be in. A little more interactive today. I've got I've got a notebook and everything for you that I'll be going through outside of the presentation. But before we jump to the chapter overview, Blake's in SoCal. I actually Blake, where I wonder where you're in SoCal. Uh, I'm in SoCal as well, in Portland. Um, Interesting. Okay, what do we got? We got DAGs, we got backdoor process. So Julio says, found the backdoor processing a little bit confusing uh, because you ignore directions in that case. Uh, and because it's NYC, Blake's Orange County, which is crazy because I'm also in Orange County. So, all right, cool. We've got a whole party here and we've got someone that lives probably really close to me, which is maybe they should just come to my house and we'll do this. We'll have a live book club. No, I'm just joking. Um, okay, let's go to the uh, let's go to the chapter overview. So in the chapter overview this time, I we talked about three things: DAG notation, biases, and uh, sample selection. And as always, um, I like to put in a picture that I think is the notable picture of the um, of the chapter. It was a little bit hard with this chapter, actually. There were a lot of pictures that were quite interesting. Um, and let me turn my let me turn my capture card off. There were a lot of pictures that were quite interesting. A lot of figures, I should say. Um, a lot of the DAG figures were quite interesting on their own, the way they were drawn. Um, there were a couple plots that I liked. But I thought this one was the most interesting one because it's the most hidden source of, of, uh, of bias, which we'll talk about in a minute here. Um, and also, I thought it's the most interesting towards towards real life, right? We always hear about doom scrolling and uh, let's see, we hear you know we experience this. We hear about doom scrolling or what ends up on the media or things like that. And it, this was a really nice mathematical explanation of why uh, certain stories come up that maybe the, the craziest stories. So I thought this was uh, I thought this was quite cool. So. We couldn't, we just have to jump straight into the right to the first topic of this chapter, which was uh, directed acyclical graphs. Directed acyclical, yeah, graphs. Hard to avoid, that's what the whole chapter was about. We, in this particular book had two, um, turn my screen back on. It had confounder, so these are, this are the arrows in the picture here. Um, it had collider, which the arrows go in here, and you got you know the two arrows go down, and the other one goes to the right. Um, but I have to admit, this week actually, I uh, oh, I keep turning my camera on and off. With them, that's what's happening. Whoops, one sec. Ah, I still have to learn how to control these live streams without messing up too much. Um, I have to admit, with this particular chapter, I actually ended up reading another book much more than than the one we were supposed to read. So I think I have my copy. I uh, put it down somewhere. Ah, I don't have it handy right now. Oh, I do. Um, I ended up reading both our chapter, but I also ended up reading uh, this book a whole bunch because it also has a DAG chapter. Um, so let me show you in here real quick. 
Uh, let me find a good page. I should have I should have been prepped on this. So Richard McElrath does a really good job, as you can see. He's got dags on this particular book, and admittedly, again, this is a Bayesian book. Um, again, showing that these concepts aren't Bayesian or Frequentist, but just mathematical concepts. Uh, but I'm just gonna bluntly say, I think that Richard McElvitt's book did a better job of explaining DAGs uh, and some of the nuances than we saw in, than, um, than in the causal inference, the mixed state book. I'm not saying that at all the causal inference mixed state book was bad by any extent, but I found the treatment in statistical rethinking to be even broader. And as you can see here, uh, it laid out even more confounds than the two that were presented in um, the causal inference mixtape. So um, the next thing I'm going to show you is going to include examples from both books. I was I was debating a little bit, like, is it cheating if I bring you examples from another book? But I figured, you know, the point of this book hub is to learn, uh, and I should show you folks all the materials that were useful to learn the concepts. So we are going to jump right into uh, this notebook which I have created. So I have this, if you haven't seen, I have this repo here. Um, and in this repo, I have the same, uh, the same notebook that you folks can grab uh, right here. Oh, I need to switch back to my window. So I have this notebook uh, here that I've linked below. And I have to say, if for me in this chapter, um, it was a little hard for me to wrap my head around these things just from the text. I think uh, somebody had just mentioned that. Julio actually had just mentioned that. Uh, it was a confusing because you because of getting at my, your mind around these backdoor process and things was c confusing and it took me a bit. Uh, what I found and what clicked for me is actually going in and writing this all out in code. Um, so because I use Python. Uh, I went ahead, used, well, because I like Python the best, I went ahead and used Python and just made a bunch of examples uh, from both McElreath and from uh, Causal Inference Mixtape of confounders, uh, of colliders. Where's the. Oh, I hit that by accident. Let's see if I can do that. Nope. Doesn't want to work. Okay, of colliders. Um, and, and the such. And it was really through this that it finally clicked for me what uh, what was what. So before I get too far into the examples, I want to ask, does anyone have any questions about this chapter or anything in particular they want to discuss? Because maybe we'll get lucky and maybe one of the examples I have will help elucidate some of these things. So I have to wait about nine seconds for this live stream to catch up to you, but I'll pause real quick and see, see what comes in. Uh, as to what was interesting or what questions you may have. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'll just talk through the, uh, the notebook then in that case. So the point of this chapter was that if you condition or you don't condition on things, um, your your estimates of your coefficients will change. So uh, let me make this a little bit bigger for you folks so it's not as tiny. What I, what I had done and uh, what, had, again, had helped me a whole bunch was there, similar to a simulation that occurred actually both in the statistical rethinking book and in the causal inference mixtape, took a created a function that simulated you know two different uh, maybe observed variables that you've seen in this case we'll pretend that they're all observed and then they each had a, a different coefficient and then I used in this case stats models because I just didn't I just wanted to see if I could recover the coefficients I didn't care about uncertainty um, see if I could recover the parameters so in this case when I did with the confounder if you if you condition on both, you remove the confounding, you, you get 3.56 here, you get 6.789 here, you get the intercept, life is good, you get back, you get back everything. Um, but if you take that same data set and you don't condition on the confounder, you get a, a different uh, 
a different value. So confounder, uh, confounder makes sense. This one's, I think, the simpler one. Uh, the one that really blew my mind is the collider here. So in the collider, if you include, uh, if you don't include the collider, you get back the exact same value that you get here for the coefficient. Uh, but if you do include the collider, you get back a bunch of other, a bunch of other numbers, and they're not they're not the correct causal inference numbers. So sim again, simulation really is what does it for me in statistics. I have a really hard time learning statistics just from um, from books and equations. Maybe my mind is stuck in some way, but for me, I find when I do these things with code and test and try out, it all of a sudden uh, these things click. Now, in uh, in causal inference mixtape, there were applied examples. I have to give them credit. Um, there were there were two, and they were quite interesting to read through from uh, an economics perspective, and they helped. Those two examples, like the policing example, helped you think through how to build a, build a DAG from like an applied example. But I was still stuck on on how these collider biases and things work from a mechanistic level. So the example that did it for me there was the this happiness example. Let me just show you the, the graph real quick. Um, this example comes from Richard McElritt's book and he talks about uh, a DAG where, uh, let's say there there's a, you wanna, me you wanna estimate the effect of age on happiness. Now in, uh, in his simulated, data set, there's no effect on age and happiness at all. Um, people are just as happy when they're one year old, old as they are when they are 30 years old as they are when they're 100, 100 years old. Again, this is a totally made up example with simulation, but it had a nice context to it. The one thing uh, that happens in this simulated example though, is the happier you are, the more likely you are to get married. So happy people, later on in life in the simulation tend to get married. So when Richard, Richard McElrath shows in this book is that if you include marriage as uh, in your regression for happiness and age, you will get nonsensical results. Actually, you will get an, uh, a result that shows that you become unhappier as time goes on. And that is because if somebody guesses correctly, you're conditioning on the collider. And that's also what's shown here. Um, over time, as the happy people get married, the unhappy people are the ones that aren't married. And so if you condition on both, it'll show that happiness and age are negatively correlated. And this really stuck, <laughs> hurt my brain for a little bit, um, which we'll talk about when I get to the next slide, is that Prediction and causality uh, aren't the same thing. And I, if there's one takeaway from this chapter, at least for me and perhaps for you as well, this honestly is just like I like I knew this somewhere, but it just clicked this week. It was it was crazy to me. So uh, I'll go a little bit into uh, into a monologue here, but I think we are so ingrained with prediction that. What's important in data science is to predict the next value that we tend to throw all the variables into our XJ boost model or whatever we're doing. And by and large, that is true even in this example. If you're trying to predict uh, happiness, using marriage is the correct thing to do. Because when you use marriage, you can, you can see that the married people tend to be happier and the unmarried people tend to be less happy. So it's good, it's really good to you predict happiness by including marriage. But if you are trying to estimate the effect of happiness on age, it is bad to include the marriage variable. Um, because it will not give you the correct causal inference. So a ca the causal coefficient, the causal regression is different than the best predictive regression. And that is really, really, really important. Um, it just, again, clicked in my head today that, that these are both two really important tasks in data science, right? Predicting things and understanding the causal um, effect of things. But the same model that is good at predicting things may not be 
a very good causal model and a very good causal model may not be a very good uh, predictive model. I'm still amazed by this, uh, but I don't have anything more to say other than this is a really interesting fact of how uh, mathematics, DAGs, and regression just happen to work. And both authors say that in their, in their books. Both authors say that if you don't carefully construct uh, a directed acyclic graph with reason, it's going to be impossible or hard to make causal inferences, even if your regression is really good at predictions. Uh, Annie says, say that one more time. Unfortunately, I said a, a lot of things, so I got to figure out exactly what that is. But I think the thing that Annie was saying, uh, Annie's asking me to say is, a model that is really good at prediction may be terrible at causal inference, and a model that is good at causal inference may not be so good for prediction. And so you need, if you want to do both, you may actually need two different models to do that. Hopefully that's what Annie wanted me to say. Um, I encourage you to run this example for yourself from Richard, uh, Richard McElrath's book because he shows it quite well uh, in, his, in his example. And as Julio said, uh, Richard McElrath has some really great YouTube videos. I'm actually going to pull it up right now because they are, they are incredibly good. Um, incredibly good videos. Uh, statistical Rethinking 2022. So he's got this playlist. Um, where he goes through his entire, uh, his entire book. And if you are reading his book or even actually you want to see, um, I think it's these, it's the, it looks like uh, lecture five and lecture six and you just want to watch them. He does a really good job explaining them. He's, I think he's, uh, he's one of the best, uh, explainers, explainers of statistics that I know. Um, so yeah, here's the tweet. Um, great. With that out of the way, the other thing which I is still really interesting, quite honestly, uh, but maybe a little, was a little bit more apparent, is the effect of sample biases. So it's a pretty basic statistics um, concept now that if you take a sample of folks, uh, if they're not representative of the population, that you may get mistakes. So if you, for instance, uh, sample only people that live in Beverly Hills, you might, uh, sorry, Beverly Hills um, in the United States, a very, very rich um, area or neighborhood, you will you will not estimate the income of, uh, of someone in the world um, because that is a very biased sample, for example. And that part is apparent. But what's, what was also interesting in this particular chapter was that if you have a biased sample, you may also get a negative or a uh, incorrect causal effect as well. So, in the in the um, in the causal inference book, there is an example from Scott Cunningham where he shows that the most notable actors and actresses um, tend to have an inverse, uh, I think, an inverse relationship between talent and, and beauty. And he he called it like the Megan Fox example, for instance. Uh, but if you look at all aspiring actors and actresses, there's no actual effect, uh, but there's no actual relationship between talent and beauty in that case. It's only when you subset to the ones that are most notable by being sort of far away from, this, from the origin uh, and in this region that you get this negative slope. And rethinking, uh, Richard McElroy did actually the same exact concept. Um, newsworthy articles or newsworthy studies are the least uh, least trustworthy. So the same thing here that you, he uses the the axes trustworthiness and newsworthiness. If you include uh, all of the studies that have been published or were attempted to be published, there's no correlation between trustworthiness and newsworthiness. But if you just use the if you just get the selected ones, the ones that happen to be in a journal, you'll see a negative relationship. Uh, because either an article has to be really trustworthy for it to end up in a journal or it has to be really newsworthy to end up in a journal or it has to have some combination of either. So that's why you get this uh, slope as well. So another really good lesson though in that even if you construct um, a DAG and it's and uh, you've got the mechanisms correctly, sorry, and you've got the arrows drawn correctly and you then regress on your DAG correctly by closing back doors um, for confounders or 
paying attention to colliders that close back doors anyway, um, if your samples that you're inputting are biased, your causal inference will also be also be biased. So two really good tips actually from both authors um, about thinking through your your DAGs uh, to ensure that your regressions are constructed correctly, and then thinking through your samples to ensure that that um, you're not getting any bias and incorrect causal inferences through um, bias samples as well. So as always, I like to pull out uh, pull out one quote in that uh, not even data is a substitute for deep institutional knowledge about the phenomenon you're studying. I particularly appreciate this quote um, because I had joined in, well, I had started learning statistics at a time where deep learning and uh, machine learning were, I think, becoming, well, definitely becoming really popular in the, you know, 2014, 2015 timeframe. And it felt like a lot of examples were about getting bigger GPUs and bigger neural nets and um, more about tweaking your model, like the hyperparameter tuning, and more about that sort of thing rather than thinking through how the data came to be, what the um, data generating processes were, um, and thinking through that. It was largely like Kaggle gave you this data set uh, or whoever gave you this data set and you just got to fit a model to it. And it was very model tuning focused. So uh, it's reassuring to me to keep seeing quotes like this where, where uh, there are other statisticians, I think very good statisticians that are, that are saying um, you really got to think through what's happening um, with the data and with the way it's being put together instead of just throwing regression problems at it. And not even just one, but two, two statisticians, Scott Cunningham again, and then uh, Richard McElrath as well. So with that, that's all I have for this particular chapter. It wasn't, it wasn't too long of a chapter, thankfully, and there wasn't too many um, tricky bits in terms of math or anything like that. I again will uh, will pause here for a second and see if anyone has anything they want to bring up or what they want to chat about. Again, love the discussion. It's a key part of this book club. What did uh, you folks think? Anyone like this chapter? Anyone dislike this chapter? What was the effect? Sometimes I wonder how long the lag is here. I've put this on lowest latency. Annie asks, how would you apply this? Um, I assume you're telling me how would I apply this as a, as a person. Um, so Annie, retroactively, I think the way I would apply this, um, so I'll give you an example. I'm, I keep using SpaceX as an example, but I, SpaceX is frankly the most interesting company I've probably worked at uh, that I can talk about. And um, and it has real problems. So one is that SpaceX, when we were trying to get parts in to actually go launch rockets, uh, you could pay extra money to have people deliver parts faster. Now, of course, you ideally don't want to pay people to get parts in faster because you don't want to spend extra money. But I'm still curious whether there is a causal effect between paying some of the suppliers we were paying and whether parts would come into the, the door more quickly or, or not. So this is one area where I might apply it. And some confounders there might be um, the teams that we're working with and maybe the distance. Um, there's a couple like confounders like that. It could be how often some of the employees followed up with that particular supplier of parts. Uh, at Sweet Green, I'm, we, we spent a lot of time working on workplace dynamics, for instance, uh, and I would be interested in some of the causal factors there, whether the location, like whether if a restaurant is located in New York or Houston or Los Angeles, or if there's parking around a location, whether there are causal effects uh, that way as well. And what's interesting to me personally is thinking back is I had assumed that a really good predictive model would be the best way to do this, but I've like, it has been very clearly ingrained in me now that uh, I should have created a, a DAG and uh, looked for collider biases and, and things like that and back to our, 
back doors and drawn out effect paths to um, answer those questions in a better way than I had done at the time. So that's how I think I would have, that's how I would use this moving forward. Um, Chad said the effect of conditioning on the collider was surprising. I agree, Chad, the effect of, that was a, a big takeaway I had when I ran the simulations as well. Well, when I read it, I believe the authors, but running the simulations, I was also quite surprised uh, how big of a, an effect it could have. Amika says, the part I find hard is coming up with a theory, the DAG, in cases where the relationship is complicated and there are many variables. Um, Lyft had a really good example of this. There is a really good statistician, uh, actually econometrician, um, named Sean Taylor. He's, he's very, I think he's very famous for the profit model at Facebook, but he's, he's done a ton of good work. Um, he was doing a lot of this stuff at Lyft. I, um, I haven't seen exactly what he did, but I did stumble upon um, one of his colleagues who published an article from Lyft. So let me try and find that for you. Um, and I'll post that in the discourse uh, right after this session. It's a really interesting example where it shows the effects of riders and the effects of drivers and how the two come together with also the different things that Lyft is doing, such as running promotions and stuff like that. Um, Andy says, if you start paying more for vendors to deliver faster, do you train them to drag out the delivery time so they get paid more? It, Andy, this is an, a really important point. I don't know. Uh, it was it was really hard to tell. Um, so I, this is this would be a really good example again. Um, and I, I am interested because I am interested in your question, maybe not for this chapter, but for later chapters, which show potentially how maybe we could have tested for this effect and see seen what would have uh, what would have happened. So agree from a, from a conceptual standpoint and a practical standpoint. And I'm really fascinated to see if I learn how we could potentially I could have potentially answered that question at that time with causal inference methods. Um, Ambika asks, are DAGs Bayesian? So again, great question. Uh, they are not either frequentious or Bayesian. So uh, this book is a really good example. Scott Cunningham's book used frequentious methods to estimate, um, oops. One sec, my screen locked out. Let's actually just pull it up so you can see. Uh, and let me turn my camera off. Causal inference mix state. So if we go to the chapter, you'll see uh, Scott, again, is not using any Bayesian methods in this chapter at all, but he has uh, he has these R code and this Python code. So in this case, he's not, he's using, uh, he's using ordinary least squares regression, which is not Bayesian, right? It's, it's actually not even frequentious in this case. It's just uh, least squares regression fitting. So DAGs are not Bayesian or frequentious or one thing. They're just, uh, an expert's knowledge of how some outcome is affected by all these other covariates that may occur. So in this case, um, how the movie star may be, the uh, a movie star may be affected, sorry, the movie star covariate, wow, I'm struggling over words right now. A movie star outcome is affected by talent and beauty. And so this is not Bayesian or frequentious, it is just an expert's um, map of how that particular outcome could occur. And if you want to see the difference and really nail that in, you have Scott's book, which is written in a frequentious way. And then again, you have you have Richard McElroy's book here, which is very Bayesian, incredibly Bayesian, totally Bayesian. Uh, and he talks about the exact same concept. You can see it from both angles. It's quite nice. Rahul says, do you think checking for multicollinearity for independent variables in a simple linear model would help find colliders? Uh, this is an off-the-cuff answer, Rahul, so don't take it as uh, as complete fact. But from what I understand, multicollinearity and colliders are two different um, concepts. Now you need you should check for both in regression. I know that for multicollinearity, I know will cause regression problems from prior experience and identifiability. But colliders are are um, another thing. From what I understand from this chapter and Richard McElwitt's book, if you wanna find multicollinearity, you just need to plot a lot of things and, and see if two variables have to be very, very correlated. Um, 
But if you think something is a collider, that's not going to come from the data. That's going to come from you drawing a DAG yourself and stating that this uh, this variable may be a collider and then not conditioning on it or using it in your sort of backdoor criterion analysis. I think the uncomfortable truth that's, that both books have mentioned is the DAG is not something that you're going to... Uh, um, a computer is magically going to give to you. It's something that you as an expert need to think about and construct uh, your, and justify yourself. Uh, Blake says, can you explain the policing example a bit more? Why does conditioning on the stop itself cause spurious patterns? Okay, I'm going to give this a shot, Blake. Admittedly, um, I'm still learning how to do this well, but let's let's give it a try. Um, so here is the DAG, uh, and what we are looking for, I have to, I'm trying to remember this from memory, but we're trying to estimate, um, whether, we were trying to estimate whether if someone's a minority, whether there's the use of more force. And in this case, Stop goes from minority to four. Okay, so I, th I think, um, what does he say? Okay, so I'm not going to be able to answer this one well right off the cuff. Admittedly, this will take me a little bit longer to think through because there's a couple of things going on. But I remember two things going on with this example. One was sample bias, and then the other was um, was this thing right here. It opens up this particular path, and I think Scott was saying that we need to condition on the stop to close um, this path, if I remember correctly. I think let's Blake, let's take this one to the discourse again, because uh, my brain is not fast enough to answer DAGs quite yet live. But I th he provides a good um, example here. What I will say, this is actually another thing that I liked about Richard McElworth's book, and let me pull it up and awkwardly, uh, awkwardly show you the section that helped me a whole bunch. So if I go to my full webcam, if you have purchased this book, there is a, it's gonna be really bad, but uh, I can't focus, it's not gonna work. There, on page uh, 185 at the bottom, Richard McElrath lists out the exact steps you should take to figure out um, whether you need to close a backdoor path or not. So Scott, he tells you about them in each chapter, but um, he doesn't actually lay it out in step-by-step -step instructions. Richard lays it out in step-by-step -step instructions, and if you just go through each one of the steps, it really helped me figure out when something needed to be closed and when something needed to be open. Um, Harish says, if stop is a collider, then conditioning on it will activate a path. I'm still unfamiliar with the example stated in the book. I think mean, Harish, you're right. If, a, if stop was a collider, then conditioning on it would activate a path. In this case, it looks uh, like potentially stop is a confounder. So you need to condition on it to remove the confounding bias, which is the same thing you can see um, in this particular example here. So honestly, my my advice um, is especially well for me. If this is really confusing, um, simulate this a whole lot, just a whole bunch. Like go into go into this, um, look at this DAG, write a simulation for it. So you know, simulate each one of these particular outcomes, and then uh, simulate each one of these input variables. Have them add up to the Y in. To, this, to the outcome in the same way that you can see in the DAG here, and then just try it. I see Chad has given an answer. I'll assume Chad is uh, has a better sense of this than I do at the moment, which is great. This is why we're doing uh, a group book club, but this is awesome. I'm glad folks are really digging in uh, and getting confused in the right places and working through it together. I'm gonna move on to just the very last bit of the presentation. And then if you have any more questions, just keep dropping them in the chat and I'll get to them right at the end. Um, 
So again, for the chapter summary, then if you're gonna if you're gonna read through this or you haven't read through this yet, I think these were the three things that stood out to me: diagnotation biases and sample selection. And if you have these three takeaways, I think we're gonna be good for the remaining chapters in this book. Um, if you would like an extended treatment of of um, directly to ASIC graphs, I would pick up a copy of Statistical Rethinking. It's quite an awesome book. Or go watch um, Richard McElroy's videos, which are which are free online. And through both books, uh, I found that those two then helped me figure out what was going on. But we are not in the statist Statistical Rethinking book club. We are in the Causal Inference Mixtape book club. Uh, so let's do... Let's read another chapter. It seems like folks are continuing to be engaged and I really, really appreciate that. So the next one is the potential outcomes causal model. I'm really excited for this one because it's the first causal inference model that we'll be seeing um, in this book. And I think it's one of the ones that's the most famous, the, at least the one that I've seen, seen the most. So I'm going to try and shoot for two weeks, uh, July 24th. We'll do a live stream, same thing. I'll set up a time online or I'll create a discourse topic and we can figure out when the best time is. Um, and if we need another week, we can do another week as well, but let's try and uh, keep things moving. With that, I don't see uh, any other questions here. I'll pause for, again, another, uh, another 10 seconds. Anyone have any last minute thoughts about the book club or about the book? Or, or anything at all, even suggestions of what we should do next. All right, going once, going twice. And he says SoCal meetup. I. I think that would be fun, actually. Uh, if we tell, if we have a couple people in SoCal, let's try and do it. I will. Let's create a discourse thread. It actually, it might, it would be good to see maybe where folks are and maybe folks want to do, do local meetups. So, uh, yeah, let's definitely try it. I love the idea, Annie. All right. If there's nothing else, then of course there is always, uh, there's always the discourse. Uh, you folks have been great coming here and answering questions. Uh, and engaging with each other. I will create the new category for the, um, the new chapter right after this book, uh, right after we end the session and post a couple of topics that I had, uh, we had chatted about. Blake, uh, you should go. I think you were the one that had a question that we needed more uh, answers on. So go ahead and kick off that thread. And thank you so much for, uh, for being here again. Uh, well, en enjoy your evenings, your mornings, wherever you are, and I uh, hope to see you in a couple weeks here. Bye, everybody.